Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Bill Alcoholic. Liz Claiborne. Very nice. Thank you, Bob, for having me come here. This is really a treat. Um, This is what happens when you never say no to an AA request. You end up in a casino in in Nevada. You know, and uh, in some strange places. Um, I'm a... Who's that bald guy? He won't look at me. (laughs) I'm a zealot in a room full of zealots. It's a safe place. We can compare zealotry. This is truly preaching to the choir. Um... I imagine most of my opinions would match yours. I hope a few of them don't, so we have something to talk about. Uh, You know, I can form an opinion. I don't need any really input to form. I can just do it on the fly. It's a talent that I have, you know. And and if you speak enough in AA, you get really bored with your story, and you go through the experience of making stuff up for a while, and that doesn't feel really good because you're trying to transcend that. So what you do is you start expressing opinions because they evolve and change and you can keep your own interest. You know, it's a kind of a survival mechanism. You know, I had an ex- interesting experience driving here. Um, I came here with my sponsor, Jay and uh, Mike L, and, and we had a nice drive up here. And part of my story, which I think meshes with this step six and seven a bit, is I was raised in AA. Uh, A real strange thing happened when I was six years old. My dad got fired from a job, and rather than go to the bar, he came home. And he called Alcoholics Anonymous, and he went to a meeting in Inglewood, California, in an Alano club, which is now the Southwest Alano Club. It's moved, uh, but it's still, still alive. Um, And he went to this meeting, and he came back home, and he told my mother, you know, those people have got something down there, and I'm going to go back and find out what it is. And the next night, she went with him in order to monitor the experience, you know. And uh, don't make al jokes if you don't know what it is. You know, a lot of people make a lot of stupid al jokes because they don't know what it is. But if you know what it is, you can make some great al jokes, you know. You know, it's like... You stop and think of the consciousness of an individual that would live with us on purpose. (laughs) What are they thinking? Oh, this will be fun, you know. So she, they walked in this club, and this woman saw my mother and and went up to her and asked her why she was there. And she told this woman, "Well, I'm I'm here to make sure he fills out the form and pays the dues and talks to the counselor." And, And this woman took my mother into the other room. And uh, when my father passed away in 99, he was 45 years sober. My mother died in 2002, and she was 48 years in Al-Anon. She helped found and and form the the Al-Anon intergroup or central office in Los Angeles and worked with Jack to bring panels into prisons for the Al-Anons that are there for murdering us, and, uh, (laughs) you know, (laughs) in a whiteout, (laughs) that's it, and, uh, so I got raised in a, in a house of AA zealots. I got raised in a house that uh, had a lot of weird aunts and uncles around. Probably some of you have been raised in in one of these places. 
Uh, I don't recommend it. There's nothing worse than living in a house with two people with clear eyes that know exactly what's going on in your head. You know, it's like, it's not fair. And uh, But I'd come home and there'd be guys laying on the porch waiting for their sponsor to come home. One, one day I came home, there was a woman hiding in the garage. That was the al -Anon. You know, they have issues. And, uh, And I got raised like that. Well, Jay, my sponsor, found some old cassette tapes. And he brought them with him of my mother and father speaking. One of them is 1959. Um, and we listened to a couple of them on the way here. And it was just kind of eerie. Um, my mother, in a, in a tape in 1988, I think it was, or 87, she told the story of me from her side. Now, one of the fortunate things that happened to me is I was fortunate enough to get sober early enough where I spent 15 plus years with my mother and father in NAA doing AA stuff, and, and we got to speak together at different places a few times. Very special, very, very lucky thing. Not everybody gets to experience that and to heal with your parents, you know, the ones that are at the top of that resentment list that we heard about. Um, and my mother told the story, and she talked about how when I started drinking when I was 15, that she was laying in bed waiting for me to come home 30 years in Al-Anon by this time. And she realized, she's, damn it, I've done this before. And I'm not going to do it again. I mean, she talked about it from an Al-Anon perspective. You know, I'm supposed to have information now. How am I going to deal with this situation? And uh, she told the story of me coming back down from Oregon and, bringing my wife and two kids, and I had a U-Haul truck, and, and I had gone up there to grow my own, and uh, it was the 60s, you know, it was the 60s, and, uh, and how I came to the house, and they would not let me stay there, and she talked about how hard that was to say, no, go take care of yourself, we're not going to bring your family into this home. And she told the story because when it was time for me to get sober, who did I call? Like any good gangster, I called my mom. You know, next time you see some badass looking guy walk in here, walk up to him and ask him, do you live with your mom? <laughs> Chances are she's the only one left, you know. And... Uh, and she came and got me quickly before I changed my mind. Al-Anons are very efficient. And they're prepared. You know. And she came and got me and checked me into a place. And, and I have not had a drink since. She talked about joining her, her and my father participating in Families Anonymous. And sitting in a meeting while I was in my addiction, doing my thing, and how my father said, my son's a drug addict, and I hate his guts. And the freedom of being able to actually say it out loud and not pretend that it's something different than it is. And, uh, and then she talked about me being three years sober at that time. Very touching. Alcoholism runs in families, so does recovery. I'm a, I'm a living example of that. That it happens. Not all the time. Certainly not in our time frame. But it happens. Um, I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy. And I never went to the beach. My motorcycle rarely ran. And I was afraid to fight. But I looked really good. 
I had a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat and a primary chain for a belt and black greasy Levi's and big black boots with chains around them. I've got tattoos all over me, but I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. <laughs> my, my biker nickname was Horny. I have it tattooed on my arm right here, and it's misspelled. H O R N E Y. Horne. <laughs> you got to picture this. Bert Grimm's tattoo parlor, parlor at the Pike in Long Beach. Me and a buddy and the tattoo artist, we all three determined that's how you spell that word. <laughs> You know, we've heard some great talks already this weekend, you know, people that uh, share their experience on the step. And in, in doing that, tell your story, talk about what, how you really experience that. I don't know why they gave me character defects. It's such a small subject. You know, it's, <clears throat> it's not a lot to talk about. You know, you're 25 years sober. That's pretty over and done with, you know. And, uh So I'm going to try. I'm just going to make some stuff up and see if we can, you know, some people were deeply scarred. I was just kind of, it was only a flesh wound. And, uh, but all of us tell the story about how we didn't feel connected, how we felt separate from. Every person that stood up here so far this weekend has, has said that. I'm sure the rest will. We all tell that story. And we talk about that like it's some kind of unique experience, like it's limited to alcoholics, like we're the only ones that feel that way. I think all kids feel that way. Some of us come from very dark places, and it's worse because we truly are scarred by people that are uncaring and unsympathetic and sometimes just plain flat mean and cruel. Um, a lot of us, though, we're just like any other kid. The difference between us and those other kids that don't feel part of is that we medicated that feeling and we never grew out of it. And we use this term sometimes when we're describing this. We use this term called alcoholic thinking, as if there is such a thing. I mean, you say it often enough, it just becomes true, and we all stand around and talk about alcoholic thinking. You know, the only place you ever hear that term is in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one else ever uses that term. The professional community never uses that term. You know what they say about us? They say we are emotionally immature. And we hear that and we go, no. I have special thinking. I have alcoholic thinking, and it's never going away. And you need to consider that when you're dealing with me. I have special thinking. And I'm convinced that me, therefore you, are just emotionally immature. I think that's the core of our problem. Wilson in 6 and 7, you know, who we already heard uh, talk about it, that he uses shortcomings and character defects. And he said, well, he just didn't want to repeat himself. But something that works for me is character defects, to me, my definition of this, are aspects of my nature that don't work well, that cause conflict in my life, the way that I am, judgment, prejudice, argumentative, things like that. Shortcomings are parts of me that are completely missing, that never developed. I think I have more trouble with the shortcomings than the very obvious and easy to identify character defects about me. The stuff that's missing, because I don't know, it's not there. I have no clue that I have no compassion. I don't know. How would I know? I've never been compassionate. How would I have it to compare to? Oh, shoot, I lost my compassion. You know, goodness me, I should go get some more. You know, I mean, I just don't know. I just go about my merry way, just rolling over people and wondering why they continue to be in my way. You know, so as a kid, you know, I'm, I'm disconnected. I drink, I get healed. All the promises come true. 
Yeah. Fifteen years old, I finally get the job done. I get drunk. You know, you sip on a few beers, and finally you get the job done, and you, and you get it on. In the 60s, there's this old movie that was really done along before then called Reefer Madness. And in there, it's become just a cult classic, you know. It's so, it's so bad, it's so filled with misinformation that it's become very hip. And one of the things it says, and the primary thing it says, that marijuana leads to heroin. Well, you and I both know that's not true. Beer leads to heroin. <laughs> you know. Long before the marijuana, man, we're drinking beer. And they missed, they left the whole beer part out. You know, it's like beer's okay, but pot's not, you know. I don't know. I'm in California, man. Legalize it. Come on. <laughs> Outside issue. Fifteen years old. By the time I'm 17, I'm a bad drunk in high school. I got the big jacket, the slouch, and the sneer, and the foul mouth, and the bad attitude. I had a bit of a problem with authority, you know. <laughs> And I was big and I was loud and I was armed. You know, it was not a good combination. And I wasn't shy. I wasn't quiet and retiring. I was a very bad criminal. You can always tell when there's an alcoholic involved in criminal activity because it was an attempted whatever it was, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like he tried to rob the bank, but he forgot the car, you know. <laughs> You know? He tried to rape the girl, but she kicked his ass, you know. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> I was that kind of a criminal. And uh, so by the time I'm 17, I've already been to jail. By the time I'm 22 years old, I'm in the Oregon State Mental Institution. I needed to rest. And uh, short party. Short party about feeling separate from, and then we drink and we feel connected. And we, I think the whole idea was to have a couple of pops, get out of the house, go to the party, and have some fun. That was the whole idea. We can become social. We can communicate with people now. We can party. We're willing to take risks. The fear goes away. The zits fall off. Everything's better, you know. Well, I don't know about you, but I ended up naked in my living room watching religious television, taking notes. Party! You know? I mean, I'm having sex, menage a uno. You know? Next time you see some guy walk in here and he says, well, I'm just a party kind of guy, ask him, how many other people were at the party? You know? <laughs> we have a unique ability to end up completely alone. I mean, physically, completely alone. And we'll fight for our right to party. You know, you don't need any other proof that alcoholism is physiological other than that last three to five years and you and I were out there. There's no party. What party? Nobody's knocking on my door going, can Bill come out and play? You know, none of that's happening. At 22, I'm in a mental institution. Mental institution. I got married. I had two kids. I'm running with an outlaw motorcycle gang. I'm sticking needles in my arm every day and drinking like a fish. And I'm in a mental institution. Anybody else here been in a mental institution? Oh, come on. Well, there's a bunch of you out there going, well, it really wasn't an institution. They were just observing me. I think I remember some of you. I was in the Oregon State Mental Institution in Salem right across the street from the penitentiary so you know where you're coming from or going to. And uh, a few years ago, I went up there and spoke at a conference, and uh, I went and found the mental institution. And I get back to the little conference, and they had a dinner for the speakers and stuff on Friday night. And this guy sitting next to me, an old hippie about my age, long ponytail, came up from California, never left. And I'm talking to this, we hit it off. And I'm talking to this guy, and I go, you know, I was in the mental institution over there. And he goes, I work there. And I went, of course you do. You know, it's like, you know, after a while, you just get used to it. You know, Of course he did. He says, would you like to visit it? And I went, yes. He called security. He says, we have a dignitary from the south. I'm going to be showing him around. 
So Sunday, we, after the conference, he took me over there and I found the ward I was on. It was the same ward that Ken Kesey worked on when he wrote Cuckoo's Nest. They filmed Cuckoo's Nest in the place I was in. I had my picture taken next to the sign, you know, because like some people went to college and stuff, you know. It's like, <laughs> this is all I have. This is, this is it. This is graduate school. Katie talked about having no interest in education. I had an interest. I just didn't want to study anything, you know. I just wanted to, like, get it, you know. And uh, Anyway. So I came back down to Los Angeles and tried to get normal. The state of Oregon kicked me out. I was okay with that. And I left that wife and family up there. And uh, I came down and tried to get normal. And uh, my dad let me sleep in his garage and gave me a job in his machine shop in El Segundo. Normal for an alcoholic of my variety is you got to quit shooting heroin because you can't get anybody to go along with the concept of social heroin use. It's, it's pretty much a lifestyle. you got to quit taking LSD because normal people have two-way communication with each other. And LSD is a one-sided kind of a thing. It's not two-way at all. And, uh, and you can't you can't drink during the week because normal people have jobs, and they go to the jobs days in a row. You know, I've watched them do it, and uh, it's really incredible. Week after week, it's just pathetic. And when I drink, I don't show up no matter what. My life just stops. Everything stops. Nothing happens. Nothing really happened to me. I didn't accomplish anything. I didn't really go anywhere, unless you count the mental institution. You know, it's like. No, I didn't finish school. I didn't play sports. I didn't do anything. I just got loaded. I missed the 60s. And I was there. I was there. I was right there with them. I've told so many stories about the 60s, I've got to quit doing it. I'm not sure exactly what really happened because I lied about it so much. You know, I'm pretty sure I did not live with Joan Baez, you know. But I said I did for years, you know. I mean... You just have to make stuff up because I don't know what happened. You know, and, uh, so what you do during the week because you can't drink is you smoke pot because it's green and it's from God and it's not really drugs. And Because you know. I don't know about you, but the impact of your personality on me is devastating. I cannot do you. I need something in me all the time to cushion the blow of you on me. You know, I mean, and I, for 20 plus years, I had something in my system all the time because I just can't walk around the streets and talk to you and interact with you. I, I can't do it. I don't know how. I'm stunted. I'm crippled socially. I don't know how to do it. And the other thing that about it getting normal for me is you got to find a woman because you can't ever, ever be alone. It is a group effort getting me through life. It takes a village. You know, and, uh, and it's still some things haven't changed. I'm just a high maintenance dude, man. It just takes a lot of people to get me going. And, uh, and I found her and we got married and had two more kids. And 15 years after the mental institution, I'm 37 years old and I live in the house with this woman and these two children. And I have no emotional connection to another living human being. And I don't know that. I don't know. I can't stand outside myself and have a separate experience and gauge the one that I'm having to find out where I'm at, to put me on a scale somewhere of how emotionally connected. I've never been connected. How would I know I'm disconnected? I've never been connected to other people, as far as I can remember. And I don't, so I don't know any of this. This is all hindsight. So I called mom. She came and got me and checked me into a recovery place, you know, starting point in Costa Mesa. Now, I went to my first shrink when I was 13 because I had rage. Not anger, rage. I mean, veins bulging, eyes bulging, bile from the stomach into the throat, fist into the wall, head into the wall, double up, fall on the floor, rage at the injustice of it all. Yeah. I have no idea where this came from. And I, and I spent a year and a half with this therapist trying to work through it. And, and he helped me. And he introduced me to my favorite subject, 
me. That lifelong pursuit of self. The idea that I can go inside and discover the root cause of my problems, expose them to the light of day, understand them intellectually, adjust my behavior accordingly, and then everything will be okay. It sounds really good. I just don't think it works. Yeah. But I love the process. You'd love to have me in your group. I'm really interactive. I pretend like I care and everything. It's really, I mean, you can learn how to do it. You can learn how to do it. And I've had, I'm an insight junkie. I've had hundreds of insights and epiphanies and awakenings. And then you just sit and drink wine and think about it. You know, it's like, write stuff down. Write the great American novel. So I spent a year and a half with this guy. I spent two and a half years in group therapy at one time. I've been to several other therapists. I've been gestalted and rolfed and primal screamed. I know more about myself than is safe to know. So when it was time for me to get sober, or whatever it was I was thinking, because when I listened to my mother on that tape, she repeated some of the stuff that I said. And I don't, I don't remember any of it. I mean, I'd been up all night. I was hammered. And evidently what I said to her is I said, I've got to do something about my drinking. I've got to do something about it. Because by this time, there was no more hip dope. There was no, there was no rock and roll. There's no heroin. There's no LSD. I couldn't even smoke pot anymore. It was me in a gin bottle. All that stuff was over. Man, I'm just a garden variety alcoholic that grew up in a paisley decade, you know. And there was other stuff around. But in the end, liquor is quicker. And it worked until it stops. You ever drank yourself clear? Boy, that was never the idea, was it? You know, I'm drinking and you're not going away. That's called hell. You know, I mean, you're sitting right there. I don't know what I look like from the outside, but you're still there. You know, because I'm, I'm, drink, I'm drinking for the blackout. Thank you very much. You know, I want out of here. I don't like it. This is your reality. I want out. You know, I, I don't care for it here. And it stopped, literally stopped working. So when it was time for me to get sober, I couldn't imagine. I, and one of the things I said to her on the phone is, I don't want to go to AA. I don't want to, I don't want to be in my old man's club. You know, if, I know that if I go there, I'll just drink anyway. It won't work. And I'd been around Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I, we hung out with Chuck Chamberlain and, you know, Clancy was the newcomer. <laughs> You know, they all said he wouldn't make it. The guys that are still alive still say that about him. You know, it's like, and he's, I've confirmed that with him. You know, it's true. I mean, this is who we, I wasn't with just some people that went to meetings occasionally. I mean, I went to all the potlucks and the barbecues and the conventions. Now I know why we were going to Bakersfield all the time. I mean, there's no good reason to go to Bakersfield that I can figure out, you know, but it was the Southern California Convention. And we, you know, I mean, this is what I, but I could not imagine just coming into AA and not drinking. Could you? <laughs> I mean, really, it's too bizarre. I need to be checked in, you know, I need medication, I need therapy, you know, I, I need a rest. That's my MO. Well, while I was in this place for 35 days, they had me wear a sign around my neck. I had to make the sign. We made it in crafts. There's a little rectangular piece of cardboard with a string that went through it, and it said, I am not a counselor. <laughs> evidently, there was some confusion about that. <laughs> then they let me out. <laughs> they just let us out, you know, like we're okay now. Go forth, multiply. And I was like, where do we end up? Here. This is it, man. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. It is the world's aftercare program. You know, when all the money runs out, when everything runs out, we end up here. You know that there's no referrals from AA? There's no place you go where you walk in and you say, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. They sent me here. <laughs> that, that place doesn't exist. You know? I mean, really, the inmates are running the asylum. We are the counselors. I've been married three times, and people ask me for relationship advice. I give it to them. I figure, hell, you can't hurt them. 
They're in AA. And whatever I come up with in the way of advice could not possibly be worse than what they're planning on doing. And we say we don't express opinions or give advice. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't have a damn thing to say to each other, you know? I mean, really, come on. I need some good advice. I'm a newcomer in AA. Give me advice. Please, don't quote page numbers to me. I'm not impressed. And I won't read it anyway. And I don't get it, even if I did. You know, I need somebody to talk to me like another man. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. Please, tell me. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. I need help. I need advice. I mean, I have no social skills. I am just a giant character defect in the character defect center of the known universe, Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, the absolute worst thing we do is relationships. You know, I mean, we do a lot of stuff poorly, but relationships is right up there in the top one, you know. It isn't what we're doing here in this fellow. Aren't we practicing on each other, figuring out how to be friends and lovers and you know, sponsors and sponsees and stuff. We're practicing. We don't know. I don't know. I mean, every once in a while, you and you're in your home group. My home group's the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. It's where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. You know? <laughs> it is the epicenter of sobriety. We're sober correctly there. You know? And uh, it's one of those. You know? And right-wing death squad AA. You know? It's like, you start sharing about your girlfriend, we'll just start clapping. We don't want to hear about it. We want solution. That kind of stuff, you know. And, you know, every once in a while, you've got to stop. When you get pissed at somebody in your home group because they're behaving incorrectly, you've got to kind of take a step back, remember the story and where they came from, and you will come to the conclusion, it's amazing he can string sentences together. <laughs> For me to expect him to be rational and <laughs> and kind is like, it's irresponsible to expect that, you know. He's only 30 years sober. He just started, you know. <laughs> so I got lucky. I asked somebody to help me. And... uh he told me, he says, be at my house Thursday at 5 o'clock. Read the doctor's opinion. Make notes in the margin of what you agree with and don't, and we'll discuss it. And I did my homework, and I showed up to his house at 5 o'clock, and he did not trust me that I'd read it, and he had me sit there and read it to him out loud. And we started the journey. He said, as your sponsor, I believe it is my job to guide you through the process of the 12 steps so that you'll find a power that's greater than yourself that can restore you to sanity and relieve you of your problems, that you might get comfortable enough that you stay sober for the rest of your life one day at a time. That's my job. I would be happy to sit here and listen to what you think your problems are so that you will not share about them in the meetings. <laughs> the meetings are for recovery from alcoholism, not about how your day went. I immediately informed him down there at the Alano Club, they are breaking that rule right and left. Should we go tell them? You know? And he says, no. He says, AA is a safe place. You can go there and talk about whatever you want. It's a safe place. He says, I'm just describing to you my AA. He gave me his opinion. Thank you for that, for not being afraid to do that. And uh, and I try to do the same thing today. I try to describe my AA or the AA that I feel comfortable in that I love. But I don't profess to know what everybody needs. I believe that there are no mistakes. I believe Alcoholics Anonymous is as vibrant and effective as it has ever been in its history. I believe that. I think we're better than we were. I don't think we need to go back to basics. I think the basics haven't changed much. There's 12 steps, and we work them. You know, some people have a different take on them. Some people were weak, medium, strong AA. But ultimately, we work the steps. Or generally, we don't hang around too long. But I think 
how do I know that you don't need to walk into a room where people are sharing about how their day went and you feel relaxed and comfortable and it's a safe place and you can not participate for a period of time until you acclimatize, until the fog lifts, and then maybe you'll step out of that meeting and go look for something else. How do I know that that isn't your path? This whole idea that people are walking into AA and they're hearing stuff that's dangerous and they're not staying sober because of what they hear in meetings, I think, is bull. It's a spiritual place. It's not an intellectual place. And I don't know what your spirit needs. I know what I found. And I look back on it 25 years ago, and I feel that I was lucky. I ran into somebody that just dragged me into AA. Some years later, when I was sponsoring people, I said to him, I said, Jay, these guys I'm sponsoring aren't doing what I did. And he laughed. And I said, what are you laughing about? He goes, you were my first one. <laughs> I don't know what it takes for you to grab a hold. You know, I, I thought everybody was doing it the same way. How would I know any different? How would I not? How would I know that people weren't sitting in some other guy's living room reading the book together, going through the process? Sometime sober, I was a few months sober, and my wife comes to me and says, I'd like you to stay home on Tuesday night, if you would, and watch the children so that I can go to an Al-Anon meeting. And it pissed me off. <laughs> I told her, I said, I don't babysit. I can't believe you'd even ask me to do that. And I just stormed out of the house. Very spiritual. And I made the mistake of telling my sponsor. You know, because I don't know that you don't think that I'm okay. You know, like some guy asked me one time, he says, Bill, did you ever consider the fact that you could be completely wrong? And I thought about it and went, no. No, as a matter of fact, no, you know. And he rarely yelled at me. He, he didn't, he wasn't, you know, we, these hard ass sponsor thing. It wasn't like that. But in this case, he yelled at me. He goes, It's not babysitting, they're your children. <laughs> this was news to me. <laughs> Semantics, you know. He says, now you go back there and you tell her with a smile on your face that you'd be happy to watch your children while she goes to Al-Anon to try to find recovery in the family groups. So I went home and I went, I'd be happy, to, you know. <laughs> so my little boy was less than a year old and he just passed out right away. I didn't know what I was expecting, but I'm afraid of children. I don't know how to be a father and they're more self-centered than me. It's competition. You know, I don't want to be alone with them. I don't know how to talk to them or communicate. I don't want to play games with them and stuff, you know. It's not about them. It's about me. And this is all hindsight. I don't know that I'm afraid, you know. I mean, so we heard a, a, a great talk on fear just last last speaker. And, and I don't know that I have. I don't know that that's what it is. I'm just irritated and restless and anxiety filled and angry and I express it all in anger it's all covered up in anger and and all that and uh, so my little girl she's like three you know we're watching TV together and the next week goes by she doesn't want to watch TV she wants to play games and stuff and then she wants to go outside and play catch you know and I'm starting to develop a relationship with my children by this time after a month or two I'm not afraid of her anymore I'm starting to look forward to spending time with her she's kind of cool she's cute and she likes me you know so my wife comes home one night and she goes hey I'm not going to my Al-Anon meeting tonight and I said well you better go somewhere this is my night with the kids <laughs> who knew <laughs> certainly not me when have I ever known what was good for me? Recovery by its very nature is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. I don't know about pain so much. There is pain in life, but certainly recovery is uncomfortable. Me confronting myself is never comfortable, ever. And in 25 years of sobriety, I've just gotten used to being uncomfortable. I'm not afraid of it anymore, but it hasn't gone away. I still get uncomfortable. In situations where I'm not in charge, I'm not in control. There's a strange thing that happens to us between, I think, 8 and 12 years sober. 
I think there might be another one around 20 or so. I'm sure some of the other guys here and women could tell you what happens when you're 30 and 35. But there is an odd thing that happens between 8 and 12. I think the sheer weight of our personalities just caves in on us and crushes us. We don't know. I mean, I have no personality of my own, so I'll take on years until I get one of my own. Because I don't know who the hell I am. I don't sit around and even think about it. I just figure I'm me. I'm just, this is how it is. And at about eight or nine years sober, I got really, really uncomfortable. And at the time, I was president of AA. I, uh, I was on the fast track of making a name for myself in an anonymous organization. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it's very weird. And, uh, and I'm not conscious of any of this. Some of it, maybe. You know, I want to be better than you. I knew I was real clear on the fact that I didn't want to be just someone else sitting in the meeting. I mean, that's just pathetic. You know, I don't want to be a sheep. You know, people say, well, a bunch of sheep get in the middle because the wolves. I want to be a wolf. You know, I never wanted to be a sheep. You know, I want to be the leader. When I had to go to the Indian guides, my wife sentenced me to Indian guides with the kids, you know, and the ongoing process of trying to make a dad out of Bill. And uh, I went to my sponsor, and I go, man, I want to wear the dumbass feather and the stupid vest and all this stuff, you know. And he goes, join the Indian guides. Be an Indian. Don't be a chief, you know. So I got into it, and it's all about the patches, man. I'm going after all the patches, and, you know, and I become the chief. And, you know, it's like I, could, I couldn't help myself. I, I just didn't want to be an Indian, you know. I mean, geez. And... uh so I'm eight, nine years sober, and I go to him, and, I, and when you're president of AA and you're sponsor in most of Southern California, um, you don't really have to talk to your sponsor at all. I mean, there's no time. And uh, so I hadn't had a real conversation with him in a long time. And I wrote some stuff down because it was that bad. I actually wrote some stuff down. And uh, I went to him, and I read him my stuff, and I said, man, I need help. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's something really wrong. I need help. And he looked at me and he said, go find God. And I said, please, don't give me these mindless platitudes. Treat me some, like some wimpy newcomer. I need real practical help, not just mindless crap like that. And we were sitting down, <laughs> and he stood up and leaned over me and yelled in my face. He goes, there is nothing else. You talk a good game. Go do it. And I almost hit him. I mean, it really, really upset me to be spoken to that way. Me, of all people, you know. <laughs> and here's the picture. Here's the picture. I'm speaking at meetings. I'm sponsoring lots of guys. I'm going to lots of meetings. I'm doing, starting to do some workshops and some things like this. You know, I'm, I'm really active. I was chairman of the intergroup, I was involved in general service, I was doing all of it, you know, because that's what I do. That's who I am. That's what I do. I just do, I'm manic. I just go after it. It, it. I used to think it was because I'm such a good guy. Now I know it's just what I do. It's just who I am. I can't do it any other way. It's no special attribute. You know, I, I got lucky and I got intrigued by Alcoholics Anonymous really early. I got intrigued by it. After just a very few weeks, I started coming back just for the stories alone. I don't understand how people can say they're bored in AA. It's better than any reality television show I've ever seen. How could you possibly be bored in, of all places, Alcoholics and I? Pissed off? Sure. Resentful? Yeah. You know, but bored? That's not possible. I mean, you've got to work at that to be bored, you know? I mean, you've got to really ignore the weird stuff that's happening around you in order to be bored, you know? So I got involved, and there I was, fully involved. And I'm giving you lots of good advice. Have you ever had the experience of sitting with a person in a room somewhere, and you give them a 20-minute lecture on how they should live their life? Then they leave the room, and you think to yourself, man, that is good stuff. I should try some of that. <laughs> you know? You know? Hypocrisy, good character defect. 
I'm a liar, aren't I? I'm lying. And when, when confronted with that, I go, I'm not lying to anybody. Oh, yes, you are. You're telling them to do, you're leading them to believe that this is what you do and it is not what you do. That's a lie, Bill. No. A lie is when you say something that's completely incorrect. But when you leave stuff out, that's cool. The road getting narrower. That's a lie, Bill. You're a liar. You're a fraud. You're a fraud for God. You know? (laughs) Sorry. I left my wife and kids for a woman in AA. It's really hard when you're president of AA and it all falls apart and you got the eggs sliding down the side of your face. It's really hard to walk back in the meetings because you know they're judging you. And you know that some of them are really happy that you fell down off the pedestal. There are cheerleader groups that are out there, you know. And and then there's other people that know you really well that come up and put their arm around you and they say, Welcome to AA, dude. Have a seat with the rest of us. Because they always knew. There are the people that wait for you under the tree when they know you're going to fall out of the trees. Because they did. And some people caught me. I'm living in a storeroom over my office in El Segundo. Alone. I've never been alone. I'm a serial marrier. And uh, I don't know how to be alone. I was as miserable and as much pain as I've ever been in my life. No medication. One night I'm sitting in that room and I had the clear thought that I know I can't drink, but I need some pain medication or something. I need something to cut the pain. And I looked in the medicine cabinet and there was nothing there. I don't really remember making the phone call, but I called a friend in AA. I didn't call my sponsor. I called a friend in AA. And he asked me, he said, have you eaten? And I didn't remember whether I had or not. Because this woman I ran off with had dumped me, so I was completely alone. And embarrassed and angry and hurt and really confused. And I had nothing to turn to. There was nothing to turn to. And he came and got me and he took me to a restaurant and he fed me. And he took me to an AA meeting. That's love. That's the love in AA. Love is action. And he came and got me, and he fed me, and he took me to a meeting. And I didn't get loaded. I have no idea what would have happened if I'd have found something in that medicine cabinet. I don't, to this day, I don't know. But what was I relying on? Me. Did I know that? No. I was not conscious of anything. But my world caved in around me. Here's what I think's going on. The first step says I'm powerless. They took it easy on us and just said we were powerless over alcohol because they didn't want us to run screaming down the street. You know, after 25 years of relatively deep research, I've yet to find anything that I have any power over at all. I think I am utterly, utterly powerless. I think everything in nature is powerless. I don't think... The totality of all things needs any input from me for the unfolding to occur. You know, I don't think it needs any input from my cat or my wife or any of you or anything. I think we are just in nature powerless and we don't require any power. We don't need to have any. And all of our suffering lies in the misunderstanding of this. The fact that we think we have power, we think we need to insert ourselves into this process And the truth is we are powerless. And all of our suffering lies within the split between those two things. As I try to insert myself into the process, I look at things and I label them as right and wrong. Right and wrong doesn't exist in nature. There's no morality play in nature. The lion eats the lamb every time. And we make up parables about the fact that one day will come 
where the lion will not eat the lamb against its own very nature that it has been given. I think that lamb will always be nervous. You know? And I think when the lamb gets eaten, the lamb doesn't say, oh, this is incorrect. He just goes, oh, no. You know, it's no right or wrong. It's just what is. If I can grasp that even a little bit, I come to understand that my life, of course, it's unmanageable. It doesn't require any management by me. It just unfolds. The next indicated thing is always obvious. Life just unfolds. It's clear what I'm supposed to do. People will say, well, if all that's true, then why should I bother do anything, doing anything? And I look at them and I just go, try not doing anything. See, let, report back. Tell me how that goes. You know, go against your very nature to do stuff. Let me know lo how long you last. You know, we just do what we do. If I can get that a little bit, the second step becomes operational. I need a manager. I need a manager. To restore me to sanity, certainly enough sanity not to drink and use, but enough sanity to understand that I'm utterly powerless and that that is okay. This is not bad news. It's just the way things are. If I can get that, the third step becomes operational. They gave us the third step to give us the illusion that we're actually giving something to a power that already has it all anyway. Isn't that a classic? It is the most human step of them all because it's completely useless. You know, I mean, it's already there and they're giving us the illusion like, well, why don't you just give it up, Bill, as if, as if we actually have it, you know. So we go through this exercise of going, OK, I'm going to let you have it now. OK. Well, what life and will? The four step, the resentments, fears and broken relationships. Resentments, of course, because my happiness is totally dependent upon your behavior. And you behave incorrectly on a consistent and ongoing basis. And I am pissed at my core. You know? Resentment, I have no plan B. And this one clearly isn't working. You know, I mean, fear, fear. I have, of course I have fear because I have no plan B and this one isn't working. So I hate you and I'm afraid of you at the same time. Broken relationships, what else could I have? The sex inventory, it's really a relationship inventory when you really read it. What other kind of relationship could I have if what I'm bringing to the table is resentment and fear? All of them are broken. All of them are traumatic. All of them are dramatic. The fifth step is what we do to actually complete the third step. We physically and literally give all of that to somebody. We've identified the problem at this point. We can see what the problem is. We see the resentments. We see the fears. And I share it with you and to this manager and go, here's my stuff. I'm pooped. You take it. And six and seven, the character defects, it's only two paragraphs in the book. There's really nothing for us to do. And we'll be doing that nothing for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and you can see what the character defects are. They're in the fourth column of the resentment inventory. It's, it's not my part. It's my faults and mistakes. I mean, even if I was molested as a child, there's no part in that. It's something that happened, something horrible that happened to me. But if I'm 40 years old and I'm still carrying around that resentment, at the very least, I'm unforgiving. And those people that I'm aiming this resentment towards don't feel it. Have you ever hated somebody really intensely? And then on a certain day, you forget to hate them? So the following day, you've got to hate them extra to make up for the day you skipped. Somehow we think they feel it. They don't feel it. We carry this around. It has nothing to do with what happened. It's about what we're doing about what happened and our memory of it, our story about it. Who knows what really happened? And I've come to understand as being a child of therapy, of growing up in a therapeutic world, that all I really need to know about my childhood is it's over. <laughs> and it was extraordinarily long, you know, into my 40s and maybe even 50s, you know. Really a long one, you know. 
And what I can do with all that information, I have no idea. None. I really don't know what to do with any of it, really, to be honest with you. Then the manager gives us our first assignment. He says, go make amends. I'm going to help you get rid of the resentments. The process for ridding yourself of resentments is the amends process. Larry will share about that. So at the end of the ninth step, am I okay now? Let me ask you a question. Have any, has anybody ever said to you, he's not emotionally available for me? You ever heard that? You know what they mean by that? What they mean by that is I've got something that they want and I'm withholding it. The truth is worse. I don't have it. <laughs> and I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it. And I'm helping you look for it. <laughs> and this dance will go on forever. And I think what you're looking for me from me, you, you, you can't connect to me. And, and I really, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. I try to make up, you know, I mean, I, I try to go along with it, you know. Like you said, you're not there for me. You're not in the same room as you don't hear me when I talk to you. And I, I look at you and I go, what the hell do you want from me? And you think I'm making it up. And I'm telling you, the depth of my shallowness knows no bounds. <laughs> this is the part of me that's completely missing. It's not there. I, I can't manufacture something that isn't there. And it's definitely not an intellectual process. It's experiential. And now that I'm sober in AA, if you would like me to be emotionally available, if you would like me to be intimate with you, and what I mean by intimacy is when I can feel what you feel, because I think that's what you want. You want me to notice you when you come in the room, that you're actually a presence in the house that we live in, to be able to sense that maybe you're in turmoil about something without you having to tell me. That when you sit down and want to talk to me, that I actually look at you rather than the television so that you don't have to get pissed and turn the TV off because you really need to talk to me. And you are just an imposition in my life. And that's what you feel coming from me. And when you get mad, I'm surprised every time. <laughs> every time. And I talk about you, about how you're laying all this undue responsibility on me and all your crap and people write books about it men are from mars and women are from venus i don't believe we're that different from each other i really don't believe that anymore i'm not connected to you that's why you feel so different because i'm not connected to you i don't understand you because i don't try i need you to be with me but i don't really want you to be there all the time only at my beck and call. Somebody has to cook. <laughs> it's that bad. Am I conscious of this? No. No. When I say it out loud, it sounds horrible, but isn't it the truth? It's the truth about me. That's the truth about me. That's how I interact with you. And then when you're gone, I'm lonely. <laughs> you know? Clint said the best I've ever heard it. I have, re I have arrangements not relationships. At the end of the ninth step, am I capable of being intimate with you? No, not even close. This is 15% of the program, and we agonize over it. We've got 15 column expanded versions of the inventory, and manuals and workbooks and seminars, and we go on and on and on and on about it. And we call 10, 11, and 12 the maintenance steps. Maintain what? What have I got at the end of the ninth step that needs maintenance? Is this thing just about not drinking? I don't think so. I don't think that's what it's about at all. I think it's about relationships. I think it's about me being part of the world. I think it's about me entering the realm of the spirit. It's about me. If I was awakened on March the 27th, 1985, the rest of the journey is to take that awakening and turn it into some kind of an awareness where I'm actually aware that I'm awake. And maybe there's something I can do with this. Ten is about living an examined life, watching myself move through life. Eleven is about getting close to the manager, 
In 11, when I meditate, I can actually watch my thoughts and I come to understand at depth that I am not my thinking mind. That changes everything. Everything changes at that moment. I am not my thinking mind. And I believe that is who I am. I believe what it tells me. And when I can watch it, when I can gently bring it back to the breath, and I can interrupt this process of it thinking, I understand now I don't have to do battle with it. I don't have to change it. It's not an adversarial relationship. I can simply ignore the damn thing. And I don't think it's out to get me. I don't think it's trying to hurt me. I think it's trying to help. It's just stupid. (laughs) You know? All it's capable of doing is taking the past and projecting it into the future. That's it. That's all it does. They were looking for you before. They're looking for you now, you know, that kind of thing. You know, that's all it knows is what has happened in the past, and that's what's going to happen again in the future. If I spend all my time in my past trying to flesh out the root cause of my problems, I'm going to completely miss who I'm unfolding into today that has no connection to my past at all. This is a brand new life. It's not about the recreation of something that once was. It was never there. I'm evolving into something I've never been. That's what I should pay attention to. The twelfth step is where it all comes home. In six and seven, we can list the character defects. You can see what they are in the fourth column of that resentment list. It's judgment, prejudice, anger, violence sometimes. Um, whatever your cute little mix is. you know, Hypocrisy, lying, cheating. Any number of things, you know. You can see the patterns, and as the inventories go on over the years, you can see them better. The inventories you do later in sobriety, you're focused on that fourth column. You know what you're looking for. You know it's not them. You don't have to go through the dance of trying to blame them, no matter how guilty they appear. You know it's you. And you can do some very focused inventories. And I begin, I've begun recently in the last few years sharing my fifth step with guys that I sponsor to try to break down that barrier between sponsor and sponsee. I don't like that barrier anymore. It doesn't feel comfortable to me anymore. I know what my role is, but after you've been with me for a while, I want you to know about me. I want you to know all the stuff about me that I wish wasn't true. And there's no big flaming horrible things anymore. It's like stuff like my children don't love me enough. You know, I mean, the real pathetic stuff, you know, real childish things. Well, after all I've done for them, you know, you know, or people in AA is a classic one. You know, I got got a different sponsor and I, you know, after I tried all my best, you know, you don't want anybody to know. Oh, it's fine. Go with God, you know, and inside you're going, that son of a bitch, you know, (laughs) after all I did for that loser, you know, it's like that's a real delicious place to be, too, you know. Because there is a lot of stuff we do for people, and they're damned ungrateful. This is the character defect center of the known universe. You'll hit on my wife. You'll borrow money from me, and you won't pay it back. I'll give you a job. You'll do a crappy job, and somehow it'll be my fault. You know? And that's, that, all that niggly stuff ends up on the inventory. And you have to say it out loud to somebody. And it just doesn't sound cool when you're 25, you know? You think you'd be better than that. Oh, well. If I really want to confront my character defects, I'll sponsor people. I'll run into every one. You know, you run into all of them. Intolerance, impatience, prejudice, judgment, all of it. You run into all of it. When I get on my knees and ask for help, when I get on my knees and I ask for these defects to be removed, if I really truly become willing, I shouldn't send it away when it shows up. And it's going to look a lot like you. You are the instrument of God's will. He sends me you. Therefore, I should never try to control the experience. I have two rules that I try to live by. Always answer the phone. Get rid of caller ID. Let them all in all the time. Have faith. Have faith that whoever's calling is supposed to be in my life. Have faith in that. We profess to have faith. Alan Watts, the best definition of faith I've ever heard. Faith is not knowing and having that be okay. Not knowing. It isn't faith in the belief mechanism that I have. It's faith in not knowing and having that be okay. Just whatever comes is what it's supposed to be. 
Rule number two, never say no. I had a guy walk up to me and ask me to sponsor him. He says, I think I should tell you that I'm gay. And I said, wouldn't you rather have a gay sponsor? And he says, no. He says, I don't have any problem being gay, but drinking is an issue. Who knew? You know? I used to stand up at these podiums and say that if you were on medication, you weren't sober. I had no experience with that, but once again, I require no experience whatsoever to form an opinion. I, I heard some of you say that, and it seemed like a really good right-wing badass opinion to have, and it pissed off a lot of people, and I go, yeah, that's for me. And I started pounding on the podium and saying stuff like that. Then this guy walked up and asked me to sponsor him, and he says, I think I should tell you I'm bipolar and I'm on medication. Oh, geez. One of these losers, you know. But I can't say no, ever. I can't. It's a rule. You can't say no. You let them all in, no matter what. No matter what. And you can find a lot of support for people that will help you weed out people that are incorrectly alcoholic that you don't have to work with. And, uh, I mean, I'm arrogant, but I draw the line. Uh, so I start working the steps with this guy, and I had the experience of peeling him off the ceiling and lifting him up off the floor, you know. One time he came across, a 40-year-old grown man, he came across my living room, curled up in my lap and put his head in my neck and cried like a baby, and I just sat there and rocked it. Karen walked through the living room, and she goes, whoa. I mean, that'll get your attention, you know. It's like... People have problems I don't have, you know, clearly. You know? Now when I see that guy coming, I go, have you taken your medication? <laughs> have you had your lithium levels checked lately, you know? <laughs> what have they got you on now? You know? I had one guy tell me that he was on Respiritol. Usually there's an ooh in the audience. So I went to my other guy that's taking all forms of medication known to man. He's my walking PDR. And I asked him, I said, what's Respiritol? And he went, ooh. <laughs> he said, I give that to psychotics, you know, to stop the voices. I went, really? So I went to the other guy and I go, do you hear voices? And he says, not anymore. <laughs> Now, I think all newcomers are bipolar. And the whole medical profession is trying to medicate us, and I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't believe that's right. Um, but I know that there's people that have problems that I don't have. And the only way I'm going to find out about that and learn anything about it is to let them into my life. And I know I can't help everybody, but how do I know that you're not coming to me to hang on to me for a while until you find the right person to be with? You know? I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I'm powerless, and I'm not running the show. I'm not God. I just have to let it all come. I've had these experiences. A, a, a man said to me one time, uh, I'd like my mother, his mother was dying, and he wanted me to come to the hospital with him. And I'd never, this is early on, and I'd never had an experience like that, and I did not want to go to the hospital with him. I figured there's a line. You draw lines, right? I mean, there's some stuff we don't have to do. There's limitations, boundaries. Boundaries, you know, you know, yeah, I got to have I got to set some boundaries and, and, you know, I get to say no sometimes and all this. I don't think so. I think we just go. You know, I think we're being led. It's not a mistake. and It's not up to me to decide. There's this illusion that I have choice. And if I take a big, deep breath and I just go, I'll end up in places and I will be uncomfortable, but I will not die. And I will grow from the experience. So I go to the hospital with this guy, and she's all hooked up and wired up and stuff, and it was awful. And I sat down in a chair in the room, and I'm sitting there, and I closed my eyes, and I said a prayer, and this feeling came over me that everything is okay. There's no mistake here. Everything's okay. It's just a feeling. The light, the room didn't change colors. Nothing happened. My anxiety subsided. And I just sat there, and I looked around the room, and it was just fine. And the guy I was with is pacing the room. This is his mother that was dying. She wasn't a very nice person. And I watched him take care of her for a long time. And I sat him down next to me, 
And I held his hand, and I looked him right in the eyes, a big guy like me, kind of bigger hands, carpenter guy. And I'm holding his hand, <clears throat> and I looked at him, and I said, Al, everything's okay. There's nothing wrong here. It's just fine. Just relax. I said, let's pray. And we closed our eyes, and we said this prayer. And while I was praying, I could feel his hand. He was holding me really tight like you do when you're upset, you know. And I could feel his hand relax in mine. That's intimacy. That's what it is. It's very quiet and it's subtle. And I'm looking for a head rush all the time. You know? And I miss this stuff all the time. I miss it. And if I hadn't gone there, if I had, I even asked him later, did you have the same experience? He goes, no, man, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, it wasn't as good for him as it was for me, you know? <laughs> that happens to me constantly, you know? Just a, I am isolated, I'm alone, and I'm separate from, you know? But I had the experience. I felt the feeling. I felt that. And I've never forgotten that. My... Father got cancer, and uh, for 14 years we gave each other birthday cakes in the Hermosa Beach Men Stag. His birthday is March the 28th. Mine was March the 27th. He got sober at 37. So did I. And we, I found my daddy in AA. And was there character defects around it? Oh, you bet. We really didn't like each other very much. We couldn't. We were never able to share anything in our lives, but we could share Alcoholics Anonymous together. We, and I got to see a side of my father that I never knew existed. I got to see him around a bunch of other guys, telling jokes and scratching and burping and farting just like the rest of us, you know. And I got to see that, my father, as a man, not as my father, but as a man, as a man that brings his own baggage to the world, you know, and how he was raised. And we had those conversations. And on his 70th birthday, I made amends to him. Ten years later, he made amends to me. Ten years later when the relationship got safe, when I wasn't looking for it anymore, when I didn't need it because we were okay, that's when it came. My mother and I nursed him in a hospital bed in the living room of his house. We changed his diapers, we took care of him, and we cleaned him up, and we loved him into the next room. And we had a wonderful memorial. I mean, if you've not experienced an AA memorial, don't miss it. It's the best party in town. They talk about the real guy, you know, not this pretend cardboard cutout guy, but the real guy. That we love each other exactly as we are, just like we are. My mother moved in with us, and then she got cancer. And she was in the hospital bed in the living room of my house, and for three months I stayed home and I just took care of her. And one day I'm standing by the side of her bed, and it was time to change the diapers, and nobody else was there. And she looked at me, and she was crying, and she goes, you know, I never raised you to do this. And she thought she had lost her dignity. And I stood there by the bed, and I thought about it for a minute, and I said to her, oh, yes, you did. I remember that house that I grew up in. And I know now what you were doing with those people that were there at that house. You were saving their lives. I live in a home like that today. My wife's 20 years sober. She sponsors a lot of girls. I sponsor a lot of guys. We try to keep them separated, you know. <laughs> Sometimes she tries to set them up, which is really, given the gene pool, is not good. And, uh, and there's people on the porch. There's phones ringing all the time. And I looked at her and I said, you raised me to do exactly this. Roll over. Uh, and I changed her diaper, and we entered a level of intimacy we didn't know was available. And it isn't about the physical thing. It's just what you do to show your love for someone. You know, the second and third time, it's just work, you know. And my mother passed away in my house. And I, it has come full circle now. It has come full circle. The healing in Alcoholics Anonymous is really difficult to describe. It's something you have to experience. Once again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. The character defects of who we are, I think the process is us growing up is what it is. And we've been given the ability to watch ourselves move through life. There's a difference between self-obsession and self-awareness. 
And I think what happens to us as we go through these phases of sobriety is we get self-awareness. I can actually see how I stand in the way of my own happiness. I'm capable of making amends today fairly quickly. You know, I fall victim to myself. I'm a human being, but it doesn't last for very long. I, it's hard to get away with it once you can see it. And the seeing of it is the beginning of the end of whatever it is that's blocking us. People will tell you that you've got to give it away to keep it. No. You've got to give it away to even get it. If you're not giving it away, you don't have it. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.